Welcome to Russian History Retold, Episode 151, Pyotr Tchaikovsky and the 1812 Overture. The piece of music that started off today's podcast was by Tchaikovsky, and it's from his Nutcracker Suite, Act 1, Number 4, The Russian Dance. So last time, we debated the importance of the Mongol invasion. Today, we begin a series on the culture of Russia starting with the life of Pyotr Tchaikovsky and his monumental piece of work, the 1812 Overture. Born on May 7, 1840, to Ilya Petrovich Tchaikovsky and Alexandra Andreevna de Assier, she was the second of his father's three wives. He had four brothers, Nikolai, Ippolit, and twins Anatoly and Modeste, and one sister, Alexandra, and a half-sister, Zenadia, from his father's first marriage. The family was considered to be of lesser nobility, but for the early years of his life, Pyotr lived quite comfortably. His parents even hired a governess named Fanny Durbach, a 22-year-old French woman who taught the young boy both French and German, which he mastered by the age of six. He also began taking piano lessons at the age of five and could read music as well or better than his teachers by the age of eight. When he was 10, his parents decided that despite his obvious gift of music, he needed a practical education and sent him to the Imperial School of Jurisprudence in St. Petersburg. Since he was only 10 and the school had a minimum age of entry of 12, he was put into the preparatory school. Now this must have been extremely hard on the young boy as he was being sent away from his family some 800 miles from home. It was to have a profound effect on his psyche, especially with the death of his mother in 1854 when he was a mere 14 years of age. His mother's passing from cholera was, according to Tchaikovsky, the most traumatic day of his life, one that would haunt him forever. His father, who also contracted uh, cholera, survived, and while he continued pushing his son towards the practical field of law, he also continued to support his musical education by hiring a number of piano teachers. The first two, Franz Becker and Rudolf Kundiger, were impressed by the young boy, but neither thought he would become the impresario that he would turn out to be. Kundiger didn't think Piotr would become much, not because of the lack of talent, but because there had really never been a high-level Russian musician, well, at least not in the eyes of the Germans. There was no education available through the schools in Russia at the time, and the only way was through private tutors. By the age of 19, he graduated his school and started his short three-year career of civil service as a lowly titular counselor, the bottom of the service ladder. Within a few months, though, he rose quickly to the position of senior assistant, where he would remain until he left. Tchaikovsky was born at the right time in Russian history, as in 1859, Grand Duchess Elena Pavlovna, Tsar Alexander II's German-born aunt, founded the Russian Musical Society with pianist and composer Anton Rubinstein. The aim of the RMS was to foster Russian musical talent, which had come down from the Tsar himself. See, previously the Tsars imported musical talent from the West. Alexander II wanted homegrown talent to be given a chance. In 1861, Tchaikovsky began to attend classes there on musical theory from Nikolai Zaremba. By 1862, the St. Petersburg Conservatory was opened and Pyotr was part of the first class there. Over the coming years, it became increasingly apparent that this young man was something special. He had composed his first symphony in 1866, but neither of his teachers gave him a nod of approval. The problem was he wasn't following the strict Germanic classical style of Rubinstein and Zaremba. They both felt that their student, who was by now a teacher at the conservatory, was just too progressive. They constantly argued with Tchaikovsky over his style, demanding changes be made to the symphony before they would even think of playing it. This was to cause the young man great consternation and stressed him out to no end. In February 15, 1868, Anton Rubinstein's brother Nikolai played the symphony, minus many of the changes ordered by Pyotr's mentors, to surprisingly great success in Moscow. 
While Tchaikovsky really wanted to have it played in St. Petersburg, this was as good as he could get. Because of the obvious talent, Nikolai offered Tchaikovsky the post of Professor of Music Theory at the newly opened Moscow Conservatory. From 1867 to 1878, he dove into his post, which included becoming a critic of music. While there, he showed love for Beethoven, thought that Brahms, eh, he was overrated, and that Wagner's Das Rheingold was, quote, unlikely nonsense, though, which, from time to time, sparkle unusually beautiful and astonishing details. But one thing he was most critical of, and that was the state of Russian opera. He was to change this in time. One of the big influences in the progression of Russian music was to take place with the formation of the group known as the Mighty Handful, or the Five. Founders of the group included Vladimir Stasov and Mili Valakirov. Included along with Tchaikovsky were Modest Mussorgsky, Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov, and Alexander Borodin. These men would forever change Russian musical history. This group was to attack the Germanic disciplinary style of the conservatory in Rubinstein. Now, Balakirov was somewhat critical of Tchaikovsky, but when reviewing his work, characteristic dances, he realized his brilliance. Together, they worked on Romeo and Juliet, which was the first piece that was considered a Tchaikovsky masterpiece. He had a problem with the five because of what he felt was substandard music and the conservatory and their conservative styles. While remaining friends with many of the members of the two factions, Tchaikovsky decided to become more independent. By this time, Tchaikovsky was famous for his music, but he was not a confident man. Oh, quite the opposite. He was very insecure and had a hard time with criticism. His mentor, Nikolai Rubinstein, was one of his biggest boosters and also his sternest critic, which hurt Tchaikovsky to the core. One of the critiques that caused the most consternation was of the first piano concerto. Rubinstein so disliked it, he refused to play it. Instead, another virtuoso, Hans von Bülow, would. Because of his fear and inability to handle criticism, Tchaikovsky would deny the world some of his works, destroying them after a performance. The first was his initial opera, The Voivoda, which was based on the play written by Alexander Ostrovsky. A year later, in 1870, he did it again with his piece, Undina. The first one that he allowed to make it was the Oprichnik, which opened in 1874. Critics hated it. Mazorsky panned it, but the Russian people loved it. It is still being performed to this day in Russia. In between all of this composing, teaching, and being a critic, Tchaikovsky the person was a train wreck, mainly because of what he felt was a confused sexuality. Today, we accept the fact that he was gay. Back in his time, this was something that had to stay in private, as he would have been arrested had it been made public. Although he likely wouldn't have been given a celebrity, but the conservative elements within Russia would have certainly shunned him. The Soviets denied all of the rumors of his homosexuality, as did many of his contemporaries. Now, there's really no doubt today, as we have correspondence between him and his brother Modest, who was gay himself, as well as other letters where Tchaikovsky openly discusses his sexuality. Now, strangely, well, not so strangely maybe, if you know what's going on in Russia, in today's world, in a movie soon to come out there, they have decided to remove any hint of his homosexuality in order to gain the blessing and funding from the Russian government. So, to further confuse things with Tchaikovsky, in 1877, he decided to marry one of his former students, Antonina Milyakova. It was to prove a total disaster, as they were completely mismatched. They lived together for only two and a half months, but stayed married for the rest of his life. They never divorced. He wrote to his brother Anatoly, quote, There's no doubt that for some months on end, I was a bit insane and only now, when I'm completely recovered, have I learned to relate objectively to everything which I did during my brief insanity. That man who in May took it into his head to marry Antonina Ivanovna, who during June wrote a whole opera as though nothing had happened, who in July married, who in September fled from his wife, who in November railed at Rome 
and so on. That man wasn't I, but another Pyotr Ilyich. Another woman came into his life, but this time it wasn't romantic. Nadezhda von Meck would become his patron for the next 13 years. She was the widow of a wealthy railroad magnate. At the time, the nouveau riche of the industrialization period of Russia began to spend their newfound wealth on the arts. Tchaikovsky was introduced to Nadezhda by his lover at the time, Iosif Kotek. This relationship didn't go far as Yosef was not a faithful companion. Von Meck, though, would prove to be an important confidant between 1877 and 1890. She would give him an annual stipend of 6,000 rubles, which allowed him to concentrate on his work. Historically, though, we have a treasure trove of letters between the two, totaling over 1,000. They shared all their deepest thoughts as well as discussing his musical works. This relationship was to come to a screeching halt in 1890 when she stopped her subsidies due to her son-in-law Vladislav Pachilsky's interference. While a former student of Tchaikovsky, he was jealous of him and thought that his work should be subsidized instead. Pyotr did not take this well, but he knew he had to move on. During her years of patronage, though, we were given some of Tchaikovsky's greatest works. His reputation in Russia was booming, but so it was in Europe and the United States as well. In 1880, he was commissioned by Tsar Alexander III to create a musical piece in the commemoration of the anniversary victory over the French and the 25th anniversary of his coronation. Excuse me, that was Alexander II. It was first played on August 20th, 1882, under a tent near the Cathedral of Christ the Savior, which was being built in commemoration of the victory as well. In the beginning, we have a Russian melody played in Orthodox churches known as the Troparion of the Holy Cross, also known as O Lord Save Thy People. As we move along with the overture, there's an increased level of distress in the music to relay the feeling of nervousness felt in Russia as the French approached their borders and finally crossed the Niemen River and invaded. Then we begin to hear repetitive verses of the French anthem, the Marseillaise. Now, interestingly, it was not the French anthem during Napoleon's time, as he had it banned. It wasn't until 1879 that it was reinstated. The same can be said for the use of the Russian anthem of God Save the Tsar. It wasn't the anthem of Russia until 1833. The anthem previously was Molitva Ruske, Prayer of the Russians. Now, after the victory of over the French caused by the burning of Moscow following the Battle of Borodino, we hear the Russian anthem followed by 11 cannon shots. It is a piece of music that would solidify Tchaikovsky's reputation for all time, as it's still being played all over the world. Incredibly, he wrote the piece in just six short weeks. In a letter to von Meck, he displayed a kind of a dislike for the piece, as he says it would be, quote, very loud and noisy, but without artistic merit, because I wrote it without warmth and without love. Typically a shy and reserved man, Tchaikovsky decided to return to Russia after touring Europe and America. He was a national icon, and in March of 1884, Tsar Alexander III conferred upon him the Order of St. Vladimir, which gave him a hereditary noble title. His celebrity was now complete. He continued to compose music like his orchestral suite number no. three, which was met again with huge success. After its premiere, he wrote to von Meck, quote, I have never seen such a triumph. I saw the whole audience was moved and grateful to me. These moments are the finest adornments of an artist's life. Thanks to these, it is worth living and laboring. He was also conducting music around the world coming to America where he helped open Carnegie Hall in 1891, where he led the orchestra in his festival coronation march. Now there's a false rumor out there that he conducted the 1812 overture at that time, but that's simply not the truth. It was the festival coronation march. Tchaikovsky became more and more at ease with his celebrity, but there was always a hint of depression surrounding him. Many claim it was due to his sexuality, others because of his upbringing, and others just because of his personality. On October 28, 1893, Tchaikovsky conducted his newest piece, 
the sixth symphony, beautiful one, also known as the Pathétique. It would be his last as he died on November 6th, supposedly, of cholera. Now, as we look back on his career, we can listen to some of the most iconic Russian musical pieces of all time. It runs the gamut like his three ballets, The Nutcracker, Swan Lake, and The Sleeping Beauty. Or his operas like Eugene Onegin or The Queen of Spades. And of course, his numerous piano and violin concertos, Romeo and Juliet, along with, of course, the 1812 Overture. Tchaikovsky merged the Western style with a Russian flair that was universally embraced by audiences to this day. A national treasure, Pyotr Ilyich left the world far too early at the age of 53. I'm really happy to have shared this with all of you as it celebrates the history and culture of Russia, something I haven't had the pleasure of doing in the past four and a half years of this podcast. It's, you know, Russian history is so filled with hardships, tragedies, and harshness. Their culture, though, is filled with life, beauty, and joy. This is why I want to continue with a series of podcasts sharing the amazing cultural achievements of a country where some of my descendants are from. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Join me next time as I cover the life of Fyodor Mikhailovich Dostoevsky. As a favor, if you got a moment and you haven't done so already, please rate the podcast on iTunes. It really does help boost its ranking and get more listeners. Drop by the blog site where you can, if you'd like to, make a donation, big or small, to keep the podcast going. Also, join us on Facebook as well, where you can ask a question, leave a message, or make a suggestion. So as always, Das Vidanya y Spasiba Bolshoya.